So with that, uh, turning to our program, I'm going to invite and welcome Rotarian Mark Money, our esteemed chancellor for the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Karen, for that warm introduction and for your leadership of Rotary and all that you do for our community. Let's hear it for Karen Hung. Good morning, and it's great to see such a great turnout for President Rothman. As I believe most of you know, UW-Milwaukee is a member of the UW System campus, and President Rothman is the president of the entire organization. He was the chairman and CEO of Foley and Lardner, and he's a big hat strategic thinker. He really has a knack for getting things done. I can't tell you how enjoyable it's been to work with Jay over the last 10 months. He earned a bachelor's degree from Marquette University and a law degree from Harvard. He's an award-winning attorney, and he served on the board of directors of several organizations in our region as well as others. They include Quad Graphics, Children's Hospital, Mayville Engineering, Inc., and others. He has a critically important job, as you're going to hear today, and it's not an easy one. Higher education today is facing a number of headwinds. Demography is just one to start with, um, but there's a number of other issues. Um, there's a book called Public No More, and it documents the decline of public uh, support for education in terms of particularly the dollars. When I came to the UW system in the 1980s, we had almost 48% of our budget funded from the state. Today, that number is closer to 18%. So these are just a few of the examples of, of uh, some of the challenges that are going on. Jay started his job on June 1st. He's jumped in with both feet. He's impressively engaged with chancellors, regents, faculty, and staff, and created a real powerful leadership team at UW System to drive several major initiatives. He's going to sh share uh, several more, I know, uh, but there's a couple that deserve special mention. He has a listen and learn tour that he began with, going to all 13 campuses and engaging meaningfully. Several of you participated in that here in Milwaukee, where he engaged with a number of individuals, spent a full day, and really had a, a lot of intense discussions, and he had a lot of different constituent groups from which he heard. That's the wonderful thing about public higher education. There's a lot of different constituents, a lot of different views uh, that are held. He also followed up that tour with major business and community groups like this important Rotary meeting today. The swift development followed of a strategic plan where he engaged thoughtfully many, many different individuals across the state that included chancellors, regents, community members, faculty and staff, legislators, and others. Now, fast forward 10 months into the job, and Jay has had no time lost in advancing many of these initiatives. He's been a Milwaukee leader for several decades, and he knows many of you, he knows the Rotary, and he also recognizes the importance of Milwaukee in the system, the region, and the larger state. Please join me in welcoming President Jay Rothman. Good morning. Let me thank Chancellor Mone for the, the kind words and also Karen for, for the invitation to be with you today. Um, I think Jamie may have said it all. I can sit down now. What is the cost of ignorance? I'm going to remember that and I hopefully you'll allow me to use it, Jamie, without some kind of copyright or something, but uh, well, we'll, we'll go from there. I really appreciate being able to spend some time with you today. Um, and it's great to be back home for me uh, in terms of where I started my professional career over three decades ago at Foley and Lardner, uh, this does feel like home. As a lifelong Madison, or, uh, Milwaukee resident until recently, uh, I'm well aware and very appreciative of the significant role the Rotary Club of Milwaukee plays and its network play in the economic and social vibrancy of this community. Wisconsinites in Milwaukee and in southeastern Wisconsin more generally have a long history being power, powerful advocates for businesses and communities uh, in this area. And you heard uh, Mark talk about it, but this area is so important, it's such an important economic and social engine for the state of Wisconsin. The region has also been a good friend of the UW system, and for that I am very grateful. The UW system shares your passion for building strong and vibrant communities. We don't forget, we are a creation of the state. 
The UW system is here to serve the state of Wisconsin and the people of Wisconsin. That is our mission and that is something we hold near and dear and really directs our action. Well, the UW system has 13 universities across the state and 26 campuses that support Milwaukee and southeastern Wisconsin. I want to draw particular attention uh, to two universities in this area, namely UW-Milwaukee, uh, which has branch campuses in both Waukesha and Washington County, and also UW-Parkside, which is located uh, near the uh, Kenosha and Racine border. UW-Milwaukee is one of our two R1 research universities. Very important designation. The second one is UW-Madison. UW-Parkside is the most diverse university that we have in the system uh, and is really a place where first, generations, stu first generation students start their educational journey. Under the leadership of Chancellor Mone and Chancellor Debbie Ford, UW-Milwaukee and UW-Parkside respectively regularly connect their UW experts with community leaders, with businesses, they collaborate on local events, share university space, programming, and research and, and resources. Again, we are here to serve the state of Wisconsin. I'll note just as one example, UWM's involvement with a system-wide freshwater collaborative of Wisconsin and how important that water is to this state, but more importantly, to our world. The collaborative is committed to making Wisconsin a leader, a world leader in freshwater science, technology, and economic growth through industry and community partnerships, including with the Water Council right here in Milwaukee. UWM plays a lead role in that collaborative, which now involves all 13 of our universities across the state. And I think as all of you know, the Milwaukee area is one of the most vibrant and dynamic areas in the state. And the industries and the businesses and the communities have unique needs. UWM and UW Parkside are well equipped to help the communities meet those needs. But our universities have needs as well. And the capital request that was approved by the Board of Regents and submitted to the legislature is, reflects that. In order to fulfill our educational mission, to stay competitive and to meet workforce demand, we must have state safe and state-of-the-art facilities. I'd ask for your, as you think about it, your local support of one project in particular, because it really impacts this region. And that is the, the work at UWM, the capital project there to consolidate the health sciences department into the former Columbia St. Mary's Hospital um, on campus to provide synergistic learning. The last step in this process, and this is the final renovation that's needed with this capital project of the buildings will help for, and will allow the university to double its enrollment capacity in health science fields, including nursing. I've had a lot of conversations with healthcare providers in the state, and particular, particularly in this region. And you know the shortage of nurses is real, and that shortage is urgent. That capital investment in the facility here is part of the answer for our community to solve that issue. It is important for UWM, but it is also important for the state of Wisconsin. So now let me talk a little bit more broadly. Um, the, the Board of Regents, which is the governing body of the UW system, approved in December a new strategic plan that we work with with the chancellors and other stakeholders to develop since I started last June. One overarching goal of that strategic plan is to increase the number of graduates from the UW system universities by 10% to about 41,000 students by 2028. And for those of you who are interested, a full copy of the strategic plan is out on the table. Uh, I'd encourage you to look at it because that is what is guiding us going forward. But that hairy audacious goal of trying to increase the number of graduates by 10% is really driven by what's going on in Wisconsin that I can only describe as a war for talent. We know that there are not enough engineers. I already talked about nurses, teachers, data scientists, business people, and that list goes on and on. We know those jobs aren't being filled in the state. And I will tell you this, because I've seen it in my corporate life. 
that to the extent that those jobs that aren't being filled can be moved, they will by necessity be moved out of the state of Wisconsin. And once they move, they're not coming back. And those that can't be moved, for example, some healthcare providers, teachers, they will go unfilled. And that will limit accessibility. And I would argue it will impact quality as well. That ought not to be an acceptable, re acceptable result for this state. We need to win that war for talent. If Wisconsin, and in particularly Milwaukee in the southeastern part of the state, in order for those regions to be economically strong and vibrant in the future. And this is a challenge because the demographics in our state aren't great. 25% of our population is 60 or older, and that population, that segment of our population is growing. Our birth rates are at low levels, really coming out of the financial crisis back 12 or 14 years ago. And one study by Forward Analytics indicated that if current migration trends continue, by 2030, we will have lost 130,000 people who would have been employable in this state. Those are the statistics that we're facing, but there are opportunities, and that's what we're looking at. The participation rate, which is the term that we use to define how many high school graduates go on to college or go on to a tech school education. The participation rate in Wisconsin is the lowest of any of the states around us. It is lower than Minnesota, it is lower than Iowa, it is lower than Illinois, and it's lower than Michigan. That means we have fewer of our high school students going on to higher education. That is a population we need to tap if we're going to win the war for talent. We have 600,000 to 800,000 residents in the state who have some college credit, but never finish their degree. And it's not true for all of them, but let's say it's true for 10% of them, that finishing their college degree would allow them to achieve more in their career or provide more to their communities. That's 60 to 80,000 students that we could graduate. We could look at drawing international students into the state and give them means to stay here. We also have opportunities domestically to bring in students from out of state and again with incentives to have them stay in the state. Those are things that we need to be looking at to win that war for talent. The other thing that one of the other major principles and, and cornerstones of our strategic plan is focused on enhancing social mobility by increasing access to historically under, underserved students in our state, including those of lower socioeconomic means. That helps directly impact that participation rate that I just talked about. We know that education can be the great equalizer. It can help people move upwards from a social perspective. One program that's focused on it that I just want to make note of right here at UWM is the Moonshot for Equity that is focused on helping students enroll and then get through and graduate from under, underserved classes. And that's a win-win. We help people be more socially mobile, and we help address the workforce needs in Wisconsin. In the war for talent, the UW system is a critical pipeline. We educate 161,000 students annually and graduate currently nearly 37,000 in high demand needs, engineers and nurses and teachers and so on. And what is really important and significant, I believe, of if you are an in-state student that goes to one of our UW system schools, there's a high likelihood that you'll be here five years from now. In fact, nearly 90% of our in-state residents who have graduated from system schools are in the state of Wisconsin five years post-graduation. Prior to coming to the, the, the university in, in, in Immersing myself in academia, I was in the private sector for over three decades. I know how acute 
the workforce shortage is in this state because I have lived it. But if we're going to win the war for talent, it is critical, I believe, that we achieve two goals. One is that we have to continue to deliver a high-quality UW education in a financially sustainable manner. And two is we have to ensure that that education is both accessible and affordable. Let me talk about affordability for just a second. We did a survey um, last summer, and not surprisingly, that survey indicated that we were the most affordable public university in the Midwest, and I would argue even beyond that the most affordable. Last Thursday, on my recommendation, the Board of Regents increased tuition for the UW system for the first time in 10 years. Even after that tuition increase, we are still going to be the best value of any public institution in the Midwest. You can tell after a 10-year tuition freeze, even when infl inflation was not high at 2%, 2% over a long period of time adds up. Not to mention the 8% inflation we had last year, the 6% inflation uh, we have this year. That tuition increase was absolutely critical to maintaining the financial stability of our organizations. Let me also talk, when we talk about affordability and the value of, college, of a college education, Jamie talked about it, what is the cost of ignorance? But I want to address what I see as a troubling trend in our country. You may have seen on Saturday the Wall Street Journal disclosed the results of a poll it had, con it had conducted on the perceived value of a college education. Only 42% of the respondents thought the value was there. That's down from 53% 10 years ago. Think about that. Only 42% of the respondents thought going to college was worth it. I find that result, frankly, scary. Is the only way that I can describe it. As the U.S. seeks to compete in a global knowledge-based economy, do we really think, do we really think we can compete in a world economy if that is our view of higher education? Now, one of the things that that survey identified, and I know all of you have heard horror stories of the amount of debt that students rack up trying to get their undergraduate degrees. And you hear the number, well, somebody racked up two hundred and fifty dollars or $300,000 worth of debt getting their undergraduate degree. All that I can tell you is if you are in the UW system and you've racked up $250,000 of debt in your educational experience, you have been in school way, way, way too long. In fact, our average debt rates of our students are lower today than they were 10 years ago, unadjusted for inflation. In actual dollars, they are lower. And the economic data around the value of a, of a college degree is unassailable. It is absolutely unassailable. You will simply earn more over your lifetime with that college degree than if you didn't have one. That is just what the data reflect. It's just that it's that simple. But I appreciate that with that said, in the value of higher education, that it does seem to be out of reach for those of lower socioeconomic means. In fact, when we did our affordability study, one of the things we learned is that we're very affordable, but the percentage of students coming from households with low of lower socioeconomic means had actually declined in the 10-year period. That is to say, there were fewer students of lower socioeconomic means in our universities today than there were 10 years ago. That can't be an acceptable result. And it was the genesis for why we announced the Wisconsin Tuition Promise, which was uh, announced last summer. The Wisconsin Tuition Promise is modeled after a very successful program at UW-Madison called Becky, Bucky, Bucky's tuition promise. And what it basically said is that if you're coming from a family with income of $62,000 or less, we will take tuition off the table for you. That is, after a Pell Grant, after a Wisconsin Grant, this is a last dollar program. But we can go to students and say tuition is off the table. And I've heard some people refer to that, well, they don't have skin in the game. The students don't have skin in the game then. That's not the right way to approach this. 
And I would argue quite to the contrary. You still have housing. You still have to feed yourself. You still have to pay for books. You still have transportation. And most importantly, you have given up four years of your, op of your life as an opportunity cost. Those students who take advantage of this program have skin in the game. The UW system will fund this. We have the financial resources. We have cobbled it together for the first year. And we'll make sure that first cohort that comes through gets to graduation but we are asking the legislature to fund it thereafter. This is an investment in the human capital of the state of Wisconsin. In the same way that we build roads and bridges, this is an investment in human capital and leads to better access, more affordability, and a higher educated workforce in the state. In terms of access, we have also um, entered into agreements with all of the technical pro colleges across the state as a means of allowing them to transfer and the, the, the institutions to transfer credits back and forth, making it easier for somebody who started in a tech college to come to one of our universities and vice versa. All of that addressing that war for talent. But in addition to graduating or to graduating talent to meet the workforce needs of our employers in the state, we are also developing in the UW system groundbreaking research. I talked about UWM being an R1. That's a big deal. Groundbreaking research that improves lives and often leads to new companies being created, new knowledge being out there, and new intellectual property. I look at it as that we are training people for jobs that do not yet exist. Think about that for a second. We are training people for jobs that do not yet exist. And the great thing about it, a lot of those people will create those new jobs. And it's not just in, in the STEM and related areas. I think sometimes the humanities get a bad rap. The humanities are important. They teach people to think critically. They teach people to analyze. They teach people to ascertain truth from fiction. Right? Is it the truth? That's what humanities are teaching people, and it is important. Moreover, the research and work that's done that helps create jobs in the state of Wisconsin, and those spin-off companies and those technology jobs employ thousands. That job creation is critical both to creating the jobs that will, that will keep people in the state and also draw people into this state from outside of Wisconsin. Think about when I was at Foley. It was hard when we were talking to people on the coast to recruit people into the state of Wisconsin. It was hard. Once they got here, you could not get them out of here with a stick of dynamite. This is a great place to live. We need to continue to draw talent into this region. As you think about it, I, I, you often hear people talk about, well, we, we spend a lot on the UW system where it's a big expenditure in the state's budget. I encourage you to look at that as an investment. It has to be viewed as an investment. If we want to grow the state, if we want our state to remain prosperous, I would argue that there is no better place to start than an investment in the UW system. The returns on that investment we offer are not just measured in dollars. though. It's me measured by richer, fuller lives. It's measured by a higher degree of civic engagement which is absolutely critical in a democracy. A democracy that quite frankly is challenged right now with how polarized that we have become. It is worth the investment, it has value. I'm grateful to Governor Evers for his support of the UW system that was reflected in the budget that he presented recently to the legislature. But I'm asking for your help as well in the communities in which you talk, in talking to legislators, to other stakeholders about the importance of the investment in the UW system. I start with capital projects. I've already mentioned the one at UWM, which is really important. But we have needs across the system. A majority of the infrastructure in the UW system was built in the 50s, 60s, and 70s oftentimes with a useful life of 50 years. 
I was never good at math. That's why I went in to be a lawyer. But I can even do that math, that we have buildings that are well past their useful life and they are showing. And it's not just to have bright, shiny buildings. But if we are going to provide a world-class education, we have to have state-of-the-art facilities. If we are going to recruit great students and great faculty that drive those institutions, we have to have state-of-the-art facilities. We've also asked for an increase in state support to offset, but only in part, the impact of inflation. Chancellor Mone mentioned that the percentage of state support, let me put it in a different format. On an inflation-adjusted basis, we are getting less from the state of Wisconsin today than we did 10 years ago. The state continues to invest, not at in an insignificant rate, but it is less than it did 10 years ago. We are asking in, on the operating side and also so that we can pay our employees fairly, a 4% increase in our operating budget in both years of the biennium. That won't address, at the end of the day, the decline in our spending power, because inflation has far outstripped that. So we know we need to manage expenses. I spent enough time in the private sector that I understand a profit and loss statement and that you have to balance out at the end of the day. So we know we've got to do our part, but we are also asking the state to help us in that endeavor as well. And the last ask is for the, the Wisconsin tuition promise. That investment to allow for social mobility that will allow us to meet the demands of our employers. Let me just leave you with this thought. When I was thinking about applying for this job, and quite frankly, every day since then, I've asked myself a couple questions. And the first question is, what would the state of Wisconsin look like without the UW system? I stop there. I just ponder that. What would Wisconsin look like without the UW system? And then the second question I ask, ask is, what will Wisconsin look like in the next 5, 10, and 15 years? Over the years, Wisconsin has invested to create an exceptional university system. When I was appointed to this job, I heard from my partners on both coasts, on the East Coast and on the West Coast. And they said, do you know what reputation the UW system has across the country? I said, yeah, I kind of do, but it was good to hear it from New York and from Los Angeles. But we cannot take that exceptional system for granted. We have to continue to invest. As if you think of your businesses and your community organizations, you invest every single day in them, and it's important. The decisions we make today, the investments we choose to make or we choose not to make, will define what Wisconsin will look like in the future. Will we have an educated workforce that will drive innovation, expand economic vibrancy, and create a, a, a stronger Wisconsin that can compete in the world of the future? Will we have that? And what will the state look like if we don't? After 10 months in my role, I have concluded that we are at a threshold in the UW system. We have not invested in our public university system as we should. And many of our universities, after a 10-year tuition freeze and declining state support on an inflation-adjusted basis, are consuming whatever savings or reserves that they have at an unsustainable rate. The ability of many of our universities in the UW system to continue their mission is now in question without the investment of additional resources. My sincere hope is that we invest wisely for the next generation so that Wisconsin remains positioned to compete successfully in a global economy. Again, my thanks for your time today. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to this group. Okay, so I think we have a few minutes for questions.
Could be an easy one. We talked a little bit uh, before about Madison, Milwaukee, campus of the competition, and we know about the golf and the sometimes destructive competition between the campuses and the cities. What are your thoughts? You said, what will Wisconsin look like without the UW system in 5, 10, 15 years? What will Wisconsin look like if Milwaukee and Madison, its campuses and cities, don't cooperate on issues like CHIPS? You know, I, I think on that issue, if and, and CHIPS is the federal program to provide, to, to try to find technology hubs and locate technology hubs. We will not achieve what we can from a prosperity perspective, from an intellectual perspective. It is absolutely essential that our universities cooperate uh, within the system, and we are working on doing precisely that because that that is how we help realize the investment that the taxpayers have made in the system over the years. I grew up in Wausau where my five siblings and I started our educational careers at UW-Marathon County and then went on to graduate elsewhere, mostly in the UW system. What role do the, do the center schools, the, the extensions, play now in the current system now and in the near future? And interestingly enough, I grew up in Wausau as well, so we have, uh, we have that in, in common. Um, I, I think uh, the, the question is relates to the branch campuses. It used to be separate campuses within the, the extension. We're doing our best to try to make sure that they remain uh, viable as access points. They are challenged from an enrollment perspective. They have felt the same enrollment challenges that community colleges across the country have felt. Um, we are doing, we are trying to continue to position them, and each one of them is unique. Um, for example, at the Wausau campus, uh, which is now part of UW Stevens Point, they are doing MBA programs there. They are doing more graduate programs. They're doing accelerated programs to, to get degrees. So there's a lot of work that's being done to try to maintain those campuses. They're important points, um, but we also have to face economic reality. Either we've got to make them functional or we've got to, to see what else we can do. And it's, it's a tough situation, to be honest with you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yes, sir. I just want to say, first of all, thank you for being here. I don't know you. Never met you before. My name is Jim Milner. I'm particularly appreciative of a couple of things you said, especially about the Promise Program. Those individuals who may not have necessarily have the chance to, to get into the institution, and it seems like you're making a way for that to happen. I don't know if you're thinking about it, but I just want to put it on your mind so that you can think about it with your leadership team, perhaps. That is, sometimes when these programs are put in place, Access just becomes a buzzword, and the opportunity for those individuals to participate is seen as a glass cliff. In other words, they can get in, but if they stumble, they can't stay in. I'm sharing that with you because I'm wondering what you're thinking about in giving the additional support that they'll need. I think we call it infrastructure. What kind of infrastructure are you building around these individuals so that they could actually survive in, in the institution? No, it's, it's, it's absolutely the right question. And the, the Wisconsin tuition program is not intended to be, well, we get you in the door, good luck. Um, we have got to invest around academic advisors and career counselors and support groups, particularly for first-generation students. One of the things I have learned in my role, and I have such enormous respect for a first-generation student. I wasn't one of those. But those students who decide that they're going to go to school, sometimes with parental support, sometimes without, have a whole lot of courage. We owe it to them to get them in the door, but we owe it to them to have them graduate. Having somebody complete a semester or a year of college and then drop out because they have found it too difficult or they haven't made it work, that is unconscionable in my mind. So part and parcel with the investment in the tuition promise, we have to have a support network. The Moonshot for Equity is one of those types of programs that help support students, but they're all across the system. We have technology that we use. We have something called EAB Navigate that identifies early on if students are struggling so that we can intervene quickly. That's being done at the campus level. Um, that we can always do it better, 
but it has to be part and parcel of the tuition promise without question. Thank you. Hi, Jay. Um, oh, I'm supposed to bring it closer. <laughs> Um, you mentioned the Freshwater Collaborative, which is growing in success and a great model of collaboration. Do you foresee using that structure in other areas? I'm thinking like data sciences. I, I think the Freshwater Collaborative is a great example of how we can get cooperation across the system. And I think that is something I would love to see that in other areas. We're working with the chancellors, and I think the, the chancellors, by and large, understand the need to collaborate, and it's starting. It's 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 accelerating. It's it's always been there, but it's accelerated. You know, what can we do, and how can we deliver education more efficiently? Uh, can we have you know two or three universities combine to offer programs as opposed to one? How can we help a, Wisconsin address some of the challenges that it faces? The Freshwater Collaborative is one. And I think the chancellors are open to have broader discussions about how we continue to do that. Uh, it, it is a very supportive group. Yes, at some level they are competing for students. I get that. But by and large, they want to do well for the state of Wisconsin. They are committed to their missions and the importance of their universities in delivering on the Wisconsin idea, that issue that the university touches everybody in the state uh, and is not bounded by the campus boundaries. Our chancellors, I think, get that, and they are, are working on greater levels of collaboration. Uh, we, we had a speaker last week that uh, pointed out the lingering impact of COVID on K through 12 education. What has been the impact of COVID on higher education? You know, it, it is certainly there. I think we've seen it in, in enrollment trends. Um, the, the good thing is the last couple of years, our freshman classes, our freshman class last year was the largest it's been since 2008. So we've got smaller classes within the university system, particularly juniors and seniors right now, uh, our smaller classes because of COVID. But I think what you were probably referring to was the learning impact. And it's there. Um, the professors talk about it. And there's that debate because the professors aren't going to lower standards. Um, because I don't think that's the answer. But how do we help students simply catch up? Because um, every, you know the, the impact of COVID that you've seen in the K through 12 schools, we have seen it as entering freshmen coming into the university system. And the campuses are working hard to try to address those issues as, as we move forward. And I think it's an issue that we're gonna see for the next 12 years or so. I mean, I think the high school, the, 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 the K through 12 schools will help people catch up, but there is no question that there was an impact. Um, I think the last piece that sometimes gets lost in all of this is the social impact as well. It's not just the academic side, it's also the social side. Is have they learned the skills to be uh, that, that require? And you know, those of you who were in college dorms, you learned a lot in the college dorm. Some of it good, some of it not so good. But but you learn how to deal with people, right? Those are the social skills. You learn how to get along. And they throw two of you into this room that wasn't much larger than this podium, or at least I remember that. You have to learn to get along with people. Those are the things that I think were lost, those softer skills. So we're doing our best job to catch up, I think is the best I can say. I want to thank you for using your experience and your intelligence at this really important project that you've undertaken. We all thank you for that. I'm curious about how do you, how do you compute return on investment for people and for your students? How do you even go about that? I think you can look at it, and it's good to see a, a, a friend from many years ago, so it's good to see you, um, that I think the, the, there are some economic standards you can use. We know what a college education will deliver in the marketplace. I think you can look at it there. Uh, I think you can measure aspects of civic engagement. But part of it is the old definition that Potter Stewart used around pornography. Sometimes you know it when you see it. Um, and I think that's what we have to look at as well. Um, that education is a value. 
it makes for a stronger, vibrant community. It results in higher economics for people with those degrees. It results in having great business institutions. And I think of the great business institutions in this, in this city. The one right, right behind us at Northwestern Neutral. You think they would have the presence here if it weren't for the university system that they have? Rockwell Automation, driven by engineers. Johnson Controls. And you keep going down that list of the great businesses in this city that have an impact on the economy. I think you see um, the, the opportunity there. And I think we can have the opportunity if we look at a comparison state. Look at states that haven't invested in education the way the state of Wisconsin has. Where do they rank versus where we rank? I think all of those are measures that we can look at in terms of what that return on investment looks like. We also have, and if you look at the strategic plan, we have a number of metrics, number of Pell students. What are we doing with graduation rates? What are we doing with retention rates? All of those are things we can measure, which in turn lead to people graduating from our universities and moving forward. And I can see the hook over here. So again, oops. thank you very much. I appreciate your attention.